from Atlanta, Georgia, it's theCUBE. Covering IFS World Conference 2018. Brought to you by IFS. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of IFS World here at Georgia World Conference here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Jeff Frick. We're joined by Tobias Person. He is the IOT services lead here at IFS. Thanks so much for joining us, Tobias. Thank you, it feels really nice to be here. So I want to start out by, by having you explain to our viewers what you do at IFS as an innovation service lead. Yes, um, I'm heading up the IFS IoT Innovation Services team that came to official in sixth existence in May last year. It's there because of the fact that we want to get the IoT message out there. We want to be out there to mission about IoT, actually helping our sales and pre-sales to do the business discussions with people, with our customers that is, as well as actually implementing solutions and rolling them out. So we're kind of like, from idea, talk to the customer, to real time, uh, oh sorry, real rollout. Uh, that's what my team does. So you said you want to get the, the IOT message out there. Yeah. And what is the IOT message from, from the IFS vantage point? Well, coming from a tech background myself, I've been involved in the IOT space for quite some years. And, and the biggest challenge or difference between normal IOT and IFS IOT is the fact that you can actually do something with the data itself. Typically, when, when you're talking about IoT historically, it's driven by R&D. It's not a strategic um, effort at all. It's mainly done to, to figure it out, and, and it has been taking some. It has taken IoT has been taken some steps since then, and we're providing a way to actually shortcut your IoT data directly into your most business critical system and, and doing something with it, providing like huge efforts and benefits off the bat. And, and you guys are really integrating IoT into the existing applications, the existing workflow. So trying to yes. grab that value, yeah. not as a standalone science project or something that's on the side, yeah. but really integrating it into your existing applications and the Correct. existing work that those applications are managing. Yeah. And, that's, that's and true. What are some of the impacts that you've seen, or some of the customer, I guess, the customer impacts that they've seen? Well, it's all about. It. Automate, automate step in a sense. Well, at, at least that's the first step. I mean, we have seen customers that's just taking the data out and getting the run is, running hours out, for example, as a first step. That has huge implications on the amount of time you spent entering stuff, as well as having the data with quality just so you can do something with it. But the biggest thing is really to automate stuff, like send out a work order, for example. Automate that. Or send out a replenishment for some consumable, or whatever it is. So anything you can run or post or, or trigger in IFS applications, field service management or UI, is actually triggerable by a, an IoT observation. So can you describe to our viewers how the process works? I mean, I know that IFS really prides itself on being so customer-centric. Yeah. So how do you work closely with customers from the very beginning, from the idea, idea to, to the actual product and implementation? Well, taking it from the start and from the top, we obviously have a full set of IT industry directors that really are really skilled and seeing what, what's next for their market, being out there to communicate the message. Servitization is obviously one, and digitalization is another one. So we're talking about this, this in all kinds of places, right? My team comes in, in, in kind of like the second stage, where this sales and pre-sales have done a demo with the generic tools that we're providing them with, and taking the discussion from there. And we're usually building something that is quite specific for the customer, uh, using their data, really any kind of data to prove the point, some kind of Power BI dashboard, some kind of actual IoT observation going out. And, and the thing is, when we do that, they tend to really get it when they see things coming in from the physical world into their kind of, this would be your FSM or applications environment. And they see an observation comes in and suddenly, boom, there's, there's an action going on. So th that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and, and, and we're kind of involving ourselves quite heavily in how to define what's your IoT use cases, running workshops with customers, and pinning it down. We ha have a, well, it's not, it's not rocket science or, or anything, but it's kind of our own methodology to, to pin down what's, what's your first step, what's, what's your IoT use case that you aim for, and how do you plan to get there? That's what we're trying to achieve with our team. It has been a big integration challenge to go to devices and sensors and kind of that IoT world and to plug that back into the application? Well, that depends a bit. I mean, our application or our, our solution is really dependent that it gets sent to data or actually picking up the data from an API or a database. Uh, we haven't seen a project yet where we're actually picking up 
stuff directly from the assets. Okay. What we usually see though, is that the customers have taken that step already, so they're getting data into some kind of, it could be a printer management system, it could be a whatever management system, and we're getting it from there. Um, we are talking to partners that, would, that will allow us to get the data strictly from an industrial context, an industrial protocol, and a specific machine, whatever it is. But as of now, um, we are reliant on the fact that somebody is sending stuff to our, the IoT Hub, which right, is the right. official uh, Azure component. So you're just really taking advantage of that data flow that's already there and yeah. really adding an extra layer of value yeah. that they can extract by pumping that into your application. Operationalize the whole thing, okay. yes. But, but that, is, that is really the key and really yeah. the, the, the differentiation is that you're not just seeing the data, you're now saying, okay, what is this data telling us and now what do we do next? What do we do with it? Yeah. So can you give us a real specific example with Antisemex and, and what, and this is the rodent control, pest control, um, company and, and sort of how this company is using your product yeah, and seeing I mean, a real return. Yeah, from what I know, Antisemix Finland has, has deployed this. They have about 3,300 traps in, in effect in, in, in out there as, at the moment. And they're using this for, well, the, the traps are connected, obviously. So they send the data for like shots fired, uh, how full it is, battery levels, stuff like that. To, to, um, to Shots the IFS fired, solution. I love it. Shots fired, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like a single off, you have to empty it directly, it's kind of a, uh, pressurized air container, uh, doing all kinds of you know, killings in a row, if you will. And, and you need to know, how are my traps doing? So it's Basically. really, again, just, this in, uh, just another layer of efficiency improvement yeah. by not just setting in, and coming back after so much time, but actually having the data for yeah, the activity in the traps. They are in a sense, they have opened their eyes, they know how their assets are doing, they know when they're full, they know when to pick it up, and, and, and even if they don't have to go there today, that's also a good information, right, obviously. Right. So they're doing this to, to optimize their, um, their service visits and, and doing like a full automated work order kind of flow. I think the statement from UC Ullinen, the, the, um, the managing director of Antisi Mix Finland, that will be here as well later on, he's, they have been doing something like 6,000 automated work orders in the last six months which is a huge productivity 6,000 automated ones. So yes. these are the ones coming directly out yeah. of the system yeah. based on the feedback from the, from the IoT. Yeah. Not passing any employee right. at all. Wow, that's so a huge, huge How thing. revelatory is that for a company to, to have all of those service visits be automated? How, how much of a change is that? I think it's huge, actually. I, I, think, I think it's quite easy to, to like imagine that that would be a good idea. However, until now it's been kind of a hassle to get there. And I th personally do think that our solution provides that gap and, and, and serves a, as, a, as a shortcut, as I mentioned before, to get there. But I would imagine too, it's a process flow on the customer side too, because they've got to now accept the fact that they don't know exactly what the schedules are going to be for the next several weeks or for those days, because they have to allocate some portion to the automated process or you know, they're feeding that in at some level upstream to make sure that that gets integrated into all the rest of the activity. Well, the, there, the, you could also have, you could have, if you want, your manual intervention uh, in all stages, if you want to. Like you need to, probably if, you need, if you're on a oil rig or something, that you have a critical part um, automated order coming in, that should be well, accepted by someone along the way. That, that's perfectly fine as well. So it's, it doesn't have to be fully automated if you don't want to, right, but it can right. be. So I know that you're you're not only an IoT evangelist with an IFS. You're you're an IoT evangelist in in, in general and in yeah, your professional well, life. So. <laughs> so can you talk to us big picture, big strategy, where you see IoT going uh, in the world, but then also as it relates to IFS? What what, do you, what does the future hold? Well, the easy answer is I, I you maybe have seen the old commercial where they state like we need to be on the web. Why? It doesn't say. I mean, that kind of you know that you need to consider this, but you don't really know. You don't really know how, how to get there. That kind of approach is, is somewhere along the line where we are right now with IoT. I mean, it used to be something like a buzzword. People try to figure it out. Nowadays, it's more like people have taken steps. They have the data somewhere. It's usually stored somewhere in some database or some system or whatever. But it's the actionable part that's missing. And I don't think people actually look for tend to look for the actual part in an in a ERP company. But that's exactly what, what, what we're writing. So I think in a few years to come, it will be seen as suspicious not to have your stuff connected and not to have your open data, instead of being the other way around. I think this will be a very natural part of, of not being blind to how your assets are doing. Why right. would you like that? I mean, that's the old fashioned stuff. 
So I think this will be a very natural step in any kind of product development as a centric or service centric company in years to come. And do you think it's indicative of people accepting just a lot more data sources into their decision making processing yeah. and adding that layer of automation? Because the piece you didn't talk about that, that's obviously part of that um, is AI at some point in time, right? Because yeah. now you've got the automation, you've got all this stuff coming in, we can't send the entire fleet out tomorrow if you only have X number of vans and you got X number, 6,000 service requests. So then you add that AI component, the machine learning component, the prioritization component, and again, moving more of this kind of manual scheduling process or routine scheduled maintenance yeah. into a much smarter way to execute the details. Yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all in the step of going from you know, data collection, data acquisition, figuring out the technical stuff behind connectivity and getting the data out, and now the next step in the revolution comes. How do you approach that with AI, with machine learning, with actionable insights, whatever. And to be quite frank, I mean, I don't think people necessarily don't want to see that. They want to see what what's comes out of it, but they don't want to see behind the curtains on that. Right, right. <laughs> so, so maybe, just maybe in the near future, people will need to bring in someone that knows uh, machine learning from, from A to, to Z in their companies, or at least use someone that, that does right. their insights for them. Right. So how will IFS expand its IoT offering in, at the next World Congress next year? Well, um, as you know, we have, a, we have had a few uh, early adopters, sorry, uh, yeah, well, early adopter programs yep, for, for IoT, yeah. And the CMEX and, and Songa Offshore being the first ones out, they're live right now and they have a really good story to tell, uh, so, so that's good. So, in a sense, we have taken it from the heavy asset or asset centric for one rig, that's one part that we have taking some steps. Service is the, is the next one, being anti CMX and Coursera. Uh, we believe that connected field service is the main thing to go for. The, the real good IoT use cases is for connected field service with assets or sending data th throughout. And to me, the next, next strategic step, since we're having a whole lot of, of, of um, revenue coming from manufacturing, is actually connected manufacturing, or connected manufacturing lines, uh, industry 4.0, or whatever you like to call it. That's our next strategic move with IoT, as I see it. The lines have been connected for giving data, but not necessarily for actionable data back into the lines, right? That's where the really big change is yeah. for the automation, uh, yeah. the automatic uh, automation back into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, automation, I mean, they, you have the full scale automation pyramid where you like have the PLC that runs the low level control system. Then you have the SCAD and the MACE systems as well. So the, the, the thing with IoT is, is not only get, do you get the data for a specific asset, you also get the full picture of like how are my factories doing on this level to this level. So it becomes more like a less operator, more kind of strategic view on the whole thing. Right, right. But you need to be able to get the data out from different levels and actually access it and, and make sense of it. Like right. Which factory is doing best? Right, and, 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 and then what are you For managing example. to? You're managing to the device, yeah. or you're managing to the whole output. Yeah. So maybe d based on economic factors, you want to run things hard, which is maybe not optimal for maintenance, but because of the economic situation, yeah. you're going you're to yes. press it. So it's really, yes. that, that variable management opportunity is, is a very different way of kind yeah. of looking at your output. And one way, one view really, right. or, or actually a scalable view really. Uh, there is a uh, stand just behind us where we'll show an industrial demo with, together with Accenture that will actually trigger a service request from a physical device, an engine in this case. Uh, that goes into the system, the IFS system, that is actually scheduled, sent to a repair guy that comes out wearing a uh, HoloLens and fix the problem, fix the issue. Right. So that's like end-to-end -end thing, it's actually manageable and doable with, with our solution. Great. And that is one of the things that the CEO talked about during the keynote too, is that it is, it is uh, automating certain tasks, but then yeah. really leaving sort of the more unique tasks up to the human and the human connecting with, with machines and also with other humans. Mm. Um, so tell me a little bit about the differences that you've seen in the market. So IFS, based in Sweden, many of its senior leaders in London, but of course uh, you have often, you places all over the world. Um, do you see any differences in terms of the customers in Europe versus the US and, and sort of how you're thinking about maybe making a bigger push into the US? It's a really good question. I have to <laughs> think about that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we are seeing in my team at least, that's, that's kind of on our horizon, is that the, the German, Germany in general are heading toward industry 4.0. That's kind of like a really hard driving fact that's like stated even by the government. So we need to get into that. As well as pushing for field service management as a solution. Um, US, I think we should be 
doing more in, let's put it that way. <laughs> great, great. Well, we look forward to hearing more about what you're going to be doing in the U.S. <laughs> more. <laughs> exactly. It's a good thing. Tobias, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. We've had a great time with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I'm Rebecca Knight for Jeff Frick. We will have more from IFS World here in Atlanta, Georgia, just after this.